Welcome to the 7.3 lecture. This will deal with cell boundaries. Um, so thinking about it, about this, we said at the beginning of this chapter that all cells have DNA and they have a cell membrane. So that membrane is the boundary that separates that cell from the rest of the world. This allows cells to maintain homeostasis. Some cells, in addition to having that cell membrane, which all cells have, whether you're prokaryotic or eukaryotic or plant or animal, fungus, protist, you all have, everyone has one. However, some cells have an additional boundary, which is a cell wall. This would be plants, fungus, um, some different types of protists. They will have various materials used for cell uh, walls. Not every protist has one. Um, let's talk about a cell wall. So the cell wall is outside of the cell membrane. This is an additional boundary, like we said. Um, in this diagram here that you can see my cursor over, that's empty plant cell walls. So whenever we said that Robert Hooke looked at uh, a cell and uh, our cells, cork is what he was looking at. He saw little structures. He called those cells or chambers. This is what exactly what he was seeing were these little empty cell walls. He wasn't seeing the living part of the cell. He was seeing the dead structure. Okay. Uh, in the case of a plant specifically, this is rigid and it is there to provide structural support and protection to the cell. And in a plant, this is always made of cellulose, which is a complex polysaccharide. This would be like wood, paper, cotton is like pure cellulose. And so if, once you uh, can form that, you can make this rigid cell wall to put your cell inside, <clears throat> which means plants can't move. That's why animals get to move is we do not have that cell wall. If you start talking about other organisms like fungus, like a mushroom or something, it has a a compound called chitin. Um, some protists will have cell walls with cellulose. Some actually have silica or like glass cell walls. They secrete a glass exoskeleton, which is super cool. Um, those are called diatoms. Um, so there's lots of different materials you can use. But when we really are specifying between animals and plants, plants always do have a cell wall and it is always made of cellulose. That's a defining characteristic of a plant. Now, now, no matter whether you're a plant or an animal or anything, you do have that cell membrane. So that cell membrane is what is actively regulating what can enter or exit the cell. Let me make my, make my circle bigger. All right. So it is said to be selectively permeable. Now, to per be permeable or to permeate, permeate means something can move through something else. If something is impermeable, it can't go through. Right. So the cell membrane, depending on what type of material you are, you can either go right through it or you you can't. Some materials can go through slowly, um, but pretty much uh, it's depending on the type of molecule. If you are a big molecule, you just can't go through the cell membrane. If you are a charged particle, like an ion, right, a positive or negative charged particle, you can also not go through that cell membrane. This means that small things that are not charged, like oxygen or carbon dioxide, can move directly through that membrane very easily, right? Think of it like a window screen, right? If you've got a window screen, it lets the air through, but it doesn't let the bugs, and that doesn't permit them to go through. That would be selectively permeable. It's permeable for that oxygen or that air it's impermeable for that ion or that bug, that June bug that's trying to get through your window, right? Now, the question is, why is it like this? It is because of how it is built. As you can see on these diagrams, uh, the cell membrane is made up of a double layer of lipids. We, what did we say about lipids? Lipids do not dissolve in water. So all cells use these non-dissolvable layers to coat themselves with, which is cool. Otherwise, if it wasn't made out of lipids, your cell membranes would totally dissolve and you don't want your cells to dissolve. We, we like our cells the way they are. Specifically, the type of lipids for this are called phospholipids. Now this is important. Um, we won't go too much into detail, but what happens is that phospholipids, the round part that we call the head, if you will, is attracted to water because it is polar. Whereas the tails, those fatty acid chains right there, are repelled by water. 
And this makes them self-assemble, butting up against one another. And that is why some things can go through and some things can't. If you are charged, you cannot go through that nonpolar region, that no charge region in the middle. So it's useful for letting things go through or not go through. Now, sometimes you do want those things to go through. So what do we have to do then? We have to use some sort of protein, some built-in integral transport protein. Um, you can see right here that I'm highlighting there's a transport protein that might pump charged particles, ions through. Or you might have just a protein channel that allows other materials like water goes through these that allows water to pass through really easily, right? So these are not just, uh, these are not fixed, right? Some of this stuff can move around. It's embedded with proteins and these carbohydrate chains that are up here help to signal and say, I'm, I'm your cell. I've got the flag that says I am this. Uh, so that's like a chemical flag. All right. So you're, everything has these. It's all made out of the same stuff and it all has proteins that allow things to move in and out. Just like if we build a wall, we can put doors and windows and vents and everything in and out of that building or that factory, if we want to go along with that, to let things move through. All right. So just, okay, so moving things through is called transport. Um, some things can move through of their own volition. It does not, they don't have to be moved. They move on their own. That is called passive transport. That is, we can move materials in and out but there's no energy needed. Specifically, the form of energy needed is ATP, adenosine triphosphate. If you have to use energy to move something in or out, it is not passive transport, it is active transport. So because the cell membrane is selectively permeable, if you're small and not charged, like you can just move directly through it. But if you've got a charge, if you're too big, you can't just go in. So the question is, what makes those materials, what drives it? What makes those materials be able just to move in or just to move out? What process is responsible for that? And the answer is diffusion. Now you've talked about diffusion before, probably in a physical science class or even uh, other classes. Uh, this is just movement of particles from area of high concentration to an area of lower concentration. Like on this image, I've got a high concentration, lots of little things. They're gonna run into each other and they're gonna spread out. Okay, they're going to move inherently from high to low. It's like in gym, if you put a pile of kickballs right in the center of the gym and everybody goes, starts playing with them, they get moving around and they just inherently spread out, right? So that is what drives diffusion is those particles bumping into one another and then spreading out, right? This just happens. As long as there's heat, they, this will occur until, this will occur until you reach equilibrium. That is, you reach equal concentration throughout. So this in equilibrium on this diagram would have all of those little green dots spread out equally over that whole thing. Equal concentration. Okay, that is equilibrium. If there's not equilibrium, then diffusion will cause materials to move one way or another. Okay. Uh, a special special type of diffusion is called osmosis. This is when water moves across a membrane, which it does all the time. Cells, water moves right through the membrane. There's little channels to let it move back and forth. But this is what's confusing is sometimes the stuff dissolved in the water can't move along with the water. In diffusion, like in air, every thing can float and spread out. But when you're talking about a cell, water can go in and out but the stuff that's dissolved in water can't necessarily go in and out. And so osmosis gets confusing when you're trying to figure out which way is water going to go. Water will always go osmos from uh, areas of higher concentration of water to areas of lower concentration of water. Well, how do you have lower concentration? You have more stuff dissolved in it. The more material dissolved in water, the less water you have. So that brings up this whole idea of what we call tonicity, right? So this is a big deal, right? Everything's made of cells. There's water in everything. We have to manage our water. So is water going to move into a cell, out of a cell, through, not do anything with the cell? So a way of describing this is that these terms called tonicity. If something is isotonic, 
okay, which you can see here, this is an isotonic medium. And we have equal concentration of materials on in the cell and out of the cell. Which way is water going to move? It's not. It's equal. It's an equilibrium, so there's no movement. Water's not going to move in or out of the cell. If you take a cell and put it in a hypertonic solution, it's like a bunch of salty water, let's say. Which way is the water going to move? Well, where is there more pure water? If there's more pure water in the cell, the water will leave the cell and move from high to low concentration. That will shrink the cell. Here is a, you can see my cursor moving. This hypertonic medium, it's losing water to that medium, that fluid. Conversely, a hypotonic solution is one that has less solutes than the cell and water is going to move in. So if you drop a cell in pure water, it's going to start all the cells will start osmosing water inside because water is moving from high to low and your cells will actually swell up. Uh, this is a problem. If you get too much pure water in your system, this causes your cells to inflate and it can even cause them to burst or lice, which is, which is problematic. If you took a, like a saltwater fish and threw it in your freshwater fish tank, all the cells would start to swell up and they would start to break and that'd be a problem. All right. Uh, as far as facilitated diffusion goes, it's still diffusion. You're still moving from high to low concentration, but you're using a protein to move through. Think of this like um, like a door that only fits one particular type of material. In this case, the one the image here. This could be glucose, which is a simple sugar. Your cells need it. It needs to get in the cell. So how is it going to get through? Well, we have high concentration outside of the cell membrane. It can't pass through, it's too big. And we wanna move it inside where there's low concentration. So these proteins act as almost like a turnstile. If you've, if you've ever been to Menards or to a train station or something, they've got the little uh, like pedestrian things you walk through and it turns the little turnstile thing and lets one person through at a time. It's kind of how these work. This protein, um, the glucose molecule locks in, it folds and drops it through, but it's still being pushed from high where there's a lot down to where there's low, right? And so diffusion is still powering this. So this is a form of passive transport, not active transport. All right, let's talk about active transport. This means that it uses some energy to make it happen. In this case, it's always going to use ATP. Um, one really good example of this is something called a membrane pump. Uh, this moves materials against their concentration gradient. That is, it moves it from low concentration to high. So think about this for a minute. If you have water at the top of a hill, if I want that water to go down the hill, what do I have to do? Dump it out. It runs downhill. Gravity does its thing and it moves downhill. But if I want that same water to be at the bottom of the hill and move it up the hill, I'm going to have to spend some energy to pump it or to carry it myself, whatever. It's going to take energy to move it uphill because I'm working against gravity. It's the same way with diffusion. If you're working against diffusion to move from a low concentration to a high, that requires energy to make it happen. That would be active transport. Your cell is going to have to spend some ATP to make that work. In this case, membrane pumps are proteins embedded in the membrane, and they move some material from low to high concentration. We will encounter this uh, several times as we talk about other cellular processes. So this is a really important thing is, you know, keeping this in mind that it takes energy to move things from low to high. Um, now, then when you move things back down from high to low, you can get some of that, sometimes that energy back out. But we'll mention that later. So, uh, membrane pumps are one form of active transport. Uh, another form of active transport is endocytosis or exocytosis. That word part, cyto means cell, like cytoskeleton is your cell skeleton. So endocytosis is moving something into a cell, exo is moving it out. <clears throat> the cell membrane, because it's not rigid like a cell wall, it's flexible, it can actually enfold around materials. Or if you have a vesicle inside from the Golgi apparatus, it can fuse with it and then dump out a bunch at once. The diagram here shows a pretty good example of this. Let's say you're making some spit, you want some uh, saliva in there, you manufacture that at the endoplasmic reticulum, it packs it in a nice membrane thing, it goes, 
it eventually ends up at the membrane. It will fuse with the membrane because they're made out of the exact same material, and then it can dump a big batch of stuff outside of the cell, like it shows right here, which is you releasing some saliva, um, if specifically some salivary amylase into your saliva, which is cool. All right, so that takes energy. On the flip side, you can also engulf things. You can, a cell can surround, a, like a white blood cell works by surrounding a bacterial cell and engulfing it, and then it puts it, uh, can digest it in its lysosomes. All right. Oh, that's what we just talked about. So phagocytosis is happening right here. You are, you are phagocytizing, you are eating. Literally, that word means cell eating. Uh, a phage or phago, phago, how you want to pronounce it means you're engulfing or eating something. So that's what's happening. Um, we've got cells drinking as well. They can take in large quantities of fluids as well. But you'll need to know the term phagocytosis as well. Okay, last thing real quick, levels of organization, right? So we may have mentioned this before, but in, in biology, okay, cells work together to make tissues, tissues work together to make organs, organs work together to make organ systems, and you put those all together to make an organism. So if we're talking about cells in this chapter, at the, this is the beginning of building an organism because you have to then link together all of these cells that we've been talking about to build some sort of tissue, like muscle tissue. And then that muscle tissue has to work with other things, other types of tissues to make an organ, like your heart. Your heart works with other organs to make a system, and you take all your different systems and put them together, and you get one single organism. Each level works together to make the level, next level. Um, we spend a lot of time at the cellular level in biology one. Um, if you're like in anatomy, the other classes offered here, uh, you would spend a lot of some time in cells, some time in tissues, and then a bunch of time at the organ system level because um, you look at each organ system individually. Put them all together, you got one single organism. All right, that is it for the seven three.